Hey, what's going on? Welcome to our head to toe assessment. Uh, we're going through trauma right now and I felt like it'd be a good time to revamp our head to toe assessment. Um, I wanted to have a brief discussion on when we do a head to toe, forming an index of suspicion. Um, and let's start with mechanisms of injury. So different examples of an MOI, mechanism of injury, maybe a fall, maybe a gunshot wound, blunt trauma, an assault. Uh, but the next step to that is identifying the significance of that mechanism of injury. So take falls, for example. Someone who fell from standing height or slid off their wheelchair or bed might be ins insignificant depending on their other medical history. Whereas if someone fell from uh, you know, second story rooftop, jumped off a, um, you know, a bridge, uh, that fall might be a little bit more significant. Let's take an MVC, a motor vehicle collision, for example. Was it a fender bender? How fast were the vehicles going? Were the patients restrained? Do you notice any spider webbing on the windshield? Is there any intrusion to the passenger compartment? Did anyone die? Or were anyone, was anyone ejected from the vehicle? All of those tell us whether or not the MOI was significant or not. And it's the significant MOI and or the patient's current condition, their mental status. Are they reliable or unreliable? Even if they're ANO times four with alcohol and drugs on board, they're unreliable. So for example, if someone, um, let's say, stubs their toe, ANO times four, no loss of consciousness, insignificant mechanism of injury, there's really no reason to perform a full head to toe assessment. Let's focus in on the specific body part that's been injured. Whereas, let's say you arrive to the scene over motor vehicle collision and one of the vehicles is on their side or even upside down. At which point, your patient who self-extricated, crawled out is ANO times four, brushed themselves off and they say, I'm good, I don't need to go to the hospital. You would do your due diligence at that point and continue to perform a head to toe. And I wouldn't feel guilty about doing so. Um, because in real life, a head to toe is mainly visual rather than verbal. And it feels slow in the classroom setting because we're verbalizing a lot of the things that we're visualizing. And when in the whole patient assessment do we perform the head to toe, right? So you ensure that the scene is safe. You form a general impression. Is there an MOI or an NOI? How many patients do we have? Is the patient sick or not sick? Do we have to consider cervical spinal stabilization. And at this point, that simply entails manual stabilization by holding their head if they can't follow commands or directions, or self-restriction by telling the patient um, to don't, please don't move your head. So it's either one of those two things, and we move on to ABCs. Do you hear any abnormal airway sounds? Uh, how's the uh, tidal volume in breathing? What's the relative rate? What's the pattern? What's the accessory muscle use? Lung sounds, pulse ox. Determine if they're in respiratory distress, failure, or arrest. Apply any applicable uh, oxygen, non-rebreather, BVM, nasal cannula, all right? And then, uh, is there any external bleeding, right? A lot of the things that we're actually gonna look for in the head to toe should have been found in the head to toe, uh, or should have been found in the ABCs, I'm sorry. Um, so the head to toe is more so a backup checklist so we don't stroll into the ER with anything that we might have missed. Um, and in circulation, there's pulse, skin, and cap refill. So with pulse, there's, um, there's four things. There's strength, relative rate, pattern, and equality. And then with skin, there's three things. There's color, temperature, moisture, and then cap refill, under over two seconds. Determine whether or not they're in shock and determine a sense of urgency for your transport decision. And then, if they did sustain a mechanism of injury, was your index of suspicion high or low? If it's high, let's do a head to toe. If it's low, let's focus on the body part in question. All right. I hope that makes sense. So, the way we've designed our head to toe assessment is to start with things that are more visual. So, with, uh, with, with the head, let's start with the head and work our way down. So, with the head, some of the visual things that might jump out are maybe unequal pupils, raccoon eyes, bruising around the eyes, bruising behind the ears, battle signs, maybe blood or CSF coming from the nose or ears, broken teeth, blood or vomit in the mouth. Take your pen light and see if the pupils react, are they pearl? Uh, and let's start palpating, right? Every body part will have DCAP, BTLS, and checking for bleeding, right? So let's palpate from the back of the head, top of the head, forehead, cheekbones, upper lip, lower lip. We're done. Let's do the neck. 
Visually, uh, what would jump out? So any open injuries, um, and we would apply an occlusive dressing, especially if there was an external bleed. We don't want air embolisms to enter our uh, circulatory system through the neck. Um, sometimes if they don't have a lot of neck tissue, maybe tracheal deviation might be noticeable, unless we might have to palpate that if it's that midline. Do you visually see jugular vein distension? And then when you palpate, you're palpating for subcutaneous emphysema, which is pockets of air trapped under the skin. Let's say someone had a pneumothorax and air is leaking from the pleura under the skin. All right, we might feel that crackling under the skin. And while we're pal palpating, let's go to the back of the neck and palpate the cervical spine while we're at it. Once we're done with the neck, let's size up a C-collar and apply a C-collar to the neck at this point. Moving on to the chest, uh, visually what might jump out? Well, any open injuries, sucking chest wounds. I wanna see equal chest rise and fall. Do you see paradoxical movement? We do have a video of that in our lab slides uh, for a flail segment. Um, let's take lung sounds. You wanna see if they're clear, wheezes, diminished, or absent. If they're absent, that kind of confirms uh, a tension pneumothorax if we see JVD and tracheal deviation up in the neck. Um, and when you uh, palpate, let's palpate for subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, and then when you're palpating the bones, let's work our way down from the shoulders, down the clavicles, down the sternum, and then um, uh, down the rib cages. All right. With the abdomen, all right, any open injuries, all right, um, any eviscerations, we have a picture of an abdominal evisceration. Typically, they're not heavy bleeders, and so not every injury is treated as you see. Um, because it's not a life threat, it's not a heavy bleeder, this is a distracting injury. Don't let it distract you from continuing the rest of the assessment, so keep that in mind. Um, similar to our previous assessment in abdominal pain, um, look, listen, and feel. So what are we looking for? We're looking for guarding, all right, with their hands. Uh, we're looking for any distension, any swelling, visible masses, discoloration, specifically around the umbilicus or the flanks. Uh, when we palpate, we're palpating for rigidity. Um, we're palpating for tenderness, rebound tenderness, uh, and pulsating masses. When we take our stethoscope and we place them five to 10 seconds in every quadrant, we're listening for periodic bowel sounds. Right, so look, listen, and feel for the abdomen. In the pelvis, we're looking for any priapism if they have a penis, uh, which is an uncontrolled erection due to uh, spinal cord trauma. And we would take our palms and we're testing for instability. So we wanna push into the ground and into each other. Uh, and we have pelvic slings. They cost about $75, $80 from Sam Medical. Um, but more commonly on an ambulance, you'll probably use a bed sheet around the greater trochanter, not the pelvic girdle, and tie a knot around the greater trochanter. Um, that bowl, that pelvis, can hold about a liter and a half of blood. It's very vascular in there. So if there's a pelvic fracture, chances are some of the vasculature might have gotten lacerated. So we wanna contain that bowl. So if that pelvis was broken, it can hold more than a liter and a half. So we really wanna stabilize that pelvis with that sling. As we palpate the lower extremities, we want to apply counter pressure. So work your way down, up and down both limbs, providing counter pressure all the way up, up and down. And then do PMS at the feet, pulses. Can you push down? Can you pull up for motor? Pick a toe on one side, do you feel that? Pick a toe on the other side, do you feel that? Similar with the arms, palpate up and down with counter pressure. And then apply PMS, test for PMS. So take the pulses, squeeze my fingers for motor. Do you feel that? Do you feel that for sensation? Um, don't forget about the back. So we're going to log roll. I would typically have two helpers, one for the head who's in charge. I would place one hand on the shoulders, one hand on the hips, and then my partner would crisscross my hands right here and then have the legs. So we're gonna log roll the patient and we're going to visually look for decap ETLS, any bleeding and uh, especially any open injuries. If you saw open injuries on the front, we wanna see if there's any open injuries on the back. Um, palpate for tenderness, uh, deformity, step-offs, uh, subcutaneous emphysema all the way down the spine. Um, and that is the head to toe, okay? So I hope that helped. Uh, leave a thumbs up if it did, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks.